And I kind of want to start with the end. Okay, we're going to go to the second chapter of Acts, verses 41 to 47. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. What in the world would we do? That happened here. Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> but I got to tell you something. I couldn't take care of 3,000 people by myself. Which is another reason for these Christian Life and Witness classes. If we get ourselves prepared to take care of God's newborns, then He'll send them to us. If we're not ready, then He's not going to trust us with them. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship. We do that pretty well. In the breaking of bread and in prayers, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added to their church daily those who were being saved. Again, what in the world would we do? I've actually had this experience at my church in uh, Meadville. Um, it was a little different situation. It came out of desperation for survival because that's where we were. We needed God to move or our church was not going to be able to stay open. And at one point, we were having somebody come to Christ once every 27 hours for seven months. I literally had my phone ring. Hello, yes, is this Reverend Moore, Free Methodist Church? Yes, would you come and lead me to Jesus? I want to be saved. No, I'm sorry, I'm too busy right now. <laughs> At that point, because I had so few people in my church, you know, I was pretty much handling everything myself. And I am sad to say that we were not able to retain all those people because it was pretty much all dependent upon me. I don't want to make that mistake again. Please, attend the Christian Life and Witness classes. Here's a 12-point picture of God's blueprint for the church. All right? I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. There was teaching of the Apostles' Doctrine. There was fellowship, the breaking of bread. There was prayer. There was a sense of awe. They had many signs and wonders. Let me just uh, kind of give you a little definition. I would say a sign is something that points people to Jesus. And wonder, obviously, something that causes people to wonder. They were sharing in generosity. They had all things common. By the way, thank you for your generosity last week. Did you see the little financial report in the bulletin? You guys gave $1,005 to Rock the Lake. Jimmy Davis was... Pretty impressed, and I am too, although I have to say I'm not too surprised, because I know you folks are generous. There was unity, there was one accord, there was gladness, there was sincerity of heart, they were praising God, they had favor with the people, and there were daily salvations. Now how does our church compare this? If this is the blueprint we want to get to, how do we compare with this? Well, I don't think it's, it's being too hard on ourselves to just say we aren't there yet. We aren't there right now, but we can be. The question is, do we want to be? And I was really hoping I'd get like at least 20 people go, yes! So I'll try to get it. <laughs> Rewind. The question is, do we want to be? Yes. All right, hey, cool. The second question is, are we willing to do what it takes to be? All right. In Haggai, we read this. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. However, this last day's church, my friends, is not yet the greater thing it should be. Listen to this again. The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former. I don't think the church, and I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. I don't think we're... Um, greater in power and glory than the church was in the book of Acts. 
All right, so how are we going to get there? Well, now let's go backwards a little bit to the first chapter of Acts. I want to start reading at the first verse. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I want to skip down to the 8th verse. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. In Matthew 18, 16, Jesus declared, I will build my church. And he is going to do that, but he's going to use us to do it. Here's what I think the plan was, and still is. Create a force. Get a fire ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit in people who are his followers. Sign me up. I can't think of any greater legacy to leave. I can't think of anything better to be written on my tombstone. Here lies Donald Moore, died at 128 years old, and worked till he was 125. <laughs> he was a force for God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow, we. And he was still riding his motorcycle. One of the things he said, though, was before you go and be the church, you're going to need some power. You know, having a bunch of people in a building on a Sunday morning does not necessarily equate with the power of the Holy Spirit. Having the holy few does not necessarily equate with the power of the Holy Spirit either. You can have a big church with the power of the Holy Spirit. You can have a small church with the power of the Holy Spirit. You can have a big church with no power. You can have a small church with no power. The thing is, are things happening with, you know, here's been my attitude, and, and I'm so thankful that I had the right people influencing my life at the right time in my life because this has been my attitude ever since I've been in ministry. God has called me to preach the gospel, lead people to Christ, and disciple them. God has never called me to make more free Methodists. And I'm going to tell you, I have some friends who are pastors of various denominations who do not share that attitude. Their attitude is, more in my seats. I can't account for them. I can tell you, God called me to preach the gospel and disciple people. If they end up in my church, that's great. I'm glad to have them. But if they don't, at least I'll see them in heaven. And isn't that way more important? Okay. I'm glad you're with me there. In the rest of the chapter, Jesus ascends into heaven and we're told the disciples went to the upper room. Now, what was the first thing that the church did together? Acts 1.14, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. I'm so thankful that uh, members of our official board who made phone calls for me last Sunday and Monday asking you all to pray. I didn't get one single report of somebody said, well, you know, I called so-and-so, but they said, no, I'm not going to pray. Thank you. I realize not everybody could go over to, to the city building, to the meeting. I realize not everybody made it here, but I'm confident you were praying. I have to be. I think I know you well enough. Do you realize this coming Friday at the annual conference, 
when they read the list of churches and they get down to Tonawanda, it says, says Tonawanda, New York, Donald Moore, it'll be the 20th time they've done that. How many of you were here back then? Raise your hand. 20 years ago. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> I appreciate it. Prayer. Prayer. I think I know some of you folks pretty well. And when you were asked to pray, I believe you prayed. I've got 20 years experience with you. Thank you. Now, Leviticus... Oh, one more thing I wanted to mention. We had uh, two National Day of Prayer services here. We had some repeaters, but when you subtract your repeaters, we had 36 people come out, which is about a sixth or seventh of our congregation actually came here on Thursday at either 11 a.m. or 7 p.m. to pray. Thank you. I appreciate that. Leviticus 6.13 says, A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It will never go out. Proverbs 26, 20, where there is no fuel, the fire goes out. Now, these verses are talking about a literal fire, but the spiritual principle is the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of our love, the fire of our passion for Jesus. This happens when we pray. If you've ever been in a relationship where you love somebody very much, whether it's a romantic love or familial love, that relationship is fueled by conversation, right? Now, I'm going to talk about something that you teens may not understand in the uh, era of texting. But when I was a teenager, I would call my girlfriend on the phone. And we would talk on the phone until my mother or father come and said, you've been on the phone for three hours. We had long conversations. And sometimes it was just this. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, nothing. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then if you had a summer camp uh, love, you know, maybe you would write letters back and forth. My point is, Prayer, like I was telling the kids, is conversation. It's not just saying, God, here's what I need today. Although God wants to know what you need, it's a conversation, right? Back and forth. And you're going to fuel your love for God through conversation. You talk to Him, He talks to you. He wrote you a love letter besides. Here it is. Read it. In the first four verses of Acts 2, the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Fire in the Scriptures is a symbol for God. Wouldn't it be great if there was a rumor spreading around in the city of Tonawanda that the Free Methodist Church was on fire? Yeah. And all the neighbors would rush to see and say, where's the trucks? <laughs> <laughs> Why did God show up like this for them? Because they were looking for it. They were seeking him. You shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. We can't be content where we are. You know, when you think about it, in our situation, this is not like my first church in Meadville where we <clears throat> went, got into survival mode. This church is not in survival mode. We have a nice building. We have a decent congregation. Pay the bills. Right? It would be very easy to be content. I don't think the verse in the Bible where Paul says, I've learned whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I don't think that applies to the church. I don't want to be content with coming here and basically having a nice little social meeting. That's not what God called me to do. And I don't believe that's what he called you to do. We need to stoke the fire in the beginning here. 
with prayer. So what happened next in the story? Look at verse 7. The world was amazed, astonished. Peter preached. They had prophecy, dreams, and visions. They had signs and wonders. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 3,000 people saved and the church was birthed in fire. We need to get the fire. For those in which the fire is already burning, we need to stoke it up and let it spread. I want to give you some suggestions on how to begin praying, okay? You might want to make a note of these, write them down. Or you can always go to www.tfmc.info, click on TFMC on YouTube and watch this sermon again and fast forward to the end again. Okay? But here it is. Pray to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ask God. Ask and you shall receive Pray for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. You know why I say that? It's like the fella who uh, went to church week after week, and uh, every week at the end of the service, he would come up front and he would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? And of course, Pastor said, yes, I will. And the guy would kneel down at the altar and he'd put his hand, he'd say, fill me, Lord. Fill me, Lord, every week. This went on week after week. And finally, after several weeks, he's up front. Fill me, Lord. Fill me, Lord. He heard somebody from the back say, don't do it, Lord. He leaks. <laughs> well, you know what? Honestly, we all do, don't we? We leak. We leak. We need the fresh infill. Fill me, Lord. And I am also confident, because it says so in here, that you folks have gifts to be used. Ask God to show you your gifts and how to use them. As He will. Fresh fire, Lord. Stoke it up. As we begin today, over the next several weeks, to prepare ourselves for a supernatural working, not just in this church, but in this whole area. I'm confident that you have a place for every single one of us to be and to take part. Thank you for that privilege, and I pray for that fire.